i, j, and k, where i squared is equal to a, j squared is equal to b, and k is i times j. An order in that case is a zillative of, of rank four that is also a ring. So it has an additional structure. It is maximal when not contained in another order. So it is kind of at the top of this kind of uh, hierarchy you can give by inclusion. And uh, orders or rings. This means that we can also have ideals of those orders. And in this non-commutative setting, ideals have distinct left and right orders. And this means that we are going to be able to build this kind of graph structure on top of the quaternion algebra by considering nodes as orders and then edges as ideals. Okay? And the Deering correspondence basically tells me that these two families of graphs that I just uh, explained to you, well, they are related to one another. If I take P, the prime characteristic, and then, then there exists some integer Q, which depends only on P, such that for the quaternion algebra, b minus q minus p, then my two graphs are basically the same. So for every isomorphism class of super singular curve, I have a corresponding isomorphism class of maximal order inside my b minus q minus p. And this is actually given by the endomorphism ring. So this is quite explicit. And of course, this is a two-way street. So the convert is also true for each maximal order. I have a corresponding curve. So this is for the nodes of my graph. Then I can do the same for the edges, which are isogenies and ideals. And in both cases, the degree and the norm of the ideals agree. A quick example, when I take p equal to 3 mod 4, then I can have q equal 1. And then this curve, E0, is super singular. And uh, here is a basis, a very nice basis, of its endomorphism ring generated by two endomorphisms, pi and yota, whose expression you can see are very simple as rational maps. Uh, and then you have the correspondence with the elements over the quaternion algebra. So it works quite well. OK. So the, the goal, uh, the original goal of the study of the Daring correspondence is, was actually Crips analysis. OK, we wanted to understand a little bit better the isogeny problem and how it could uh, relate to some problems over the quaternion algebra. So in the end, we did not end up uh, by breaking those problems, but with a bunch of nice algorithmic tools Basically, that uh, allow me to do the conversion from elements over the quaternion algebra side toward uh, elliptic curves and isogeny. So, for instance, if I have a maximal order, I can compute the, the corresponding curve. The same for ideals and isogenies. And I have also some nice features, such as finding isogenies between, between curves of known endomorphism rings. So, this is a bunch of nice tools, which has already been used constructively for signatures. So first, it was the GPS signatures and more recently, ski sign. Uh, and both really heavily are based on those uh, nice algorithms based on, on the daring correspondence. And, and the goal of this paper was kind of exploring the new possibilities offered. So pushing a little bit the limits of what we know how to do with those, with those tools. And to understand how, how we achieved that, I think we need to talk a little bit about isogeny representations. So, um, so if I go back to the definition of an isogeny, okay, this is really like between two curves, E1 and E2. As I said to you, these are rational maps. So I can give defining polynomials, uh, F1, F2, G1, and G2, which are going to basically yeah, define my isogeny. And by an isogeny representation, I uh, say this is basically a string for which there exist two algorithms. First, a verification algorithms that is going to assess basically the validity in some sense of my uh, representation uh, for a given domain, codomain, and degree. And then an evaluate algorithms that is going to take the representation, a point, and compute the image of the point uh, through my isogeny. Going back to the definition, it's quite uh, natural to, to define a representation as the four polynomials f1, f2, g1, and g2, which are used to define my isogeny. And factor my isogeny into, into small. Uh, yeah, most of the time, I'm going to be stuck with small degrees. Then we have the kernel representation. 
And this is given as one generator of the kernel. And actually, thanks to the value formulas, I can use this kernel generator to compute my, my polynomials. Okay? And this uh, representation has the advantage of being quite compact. And also, when the degree is smooth, then I can apply efficiently the value formulas. And uh, by nice, I mean that uh, the degree must, must be smooth and such that the torsion points are defined over a small extension. Uh, and you can ensure that by choosing carefully the prime characteristic. So this can always be used and done, and this is what is most often used in isogeny based cryptography. Nonetheless, the complexity is basically polynomial in D, actually polynomial in the biggest prime factor of D. But uh, in, uh, in general, this is equivalent because I can have a prime degree. Okay, so this means that it is not adapted to handle isogenies of arbitrary degrees. And in, for that case, we actually have, well, all the necessary tools with the Darwin correspondence, okay? If, and this is where I define the ideal representation, which is basically the ideal associated through the Darwin correspondence to my isogeny. So I can uh, represent that through 16 coefficients of a Z that will give me a basis uh, in the quaternion algebra of my ideal. And then thanks to the nice algorithms that we, we discovered studying the Darwin correspondence, we actually can show that this representation is both compact and efficient for any degree D and prime P. And this means that we have complexities and sizes which are polynomial in log P and log D. So quite nice. Uh, however, it's almost too good in the sense that it reveals every information there is to know about the isogeny and also the two curves E1 and E2. So this means that we can use that as a secret, but we cannot hope to reveal this ideal representation and uh, hope to hide something from a, uh, an adversary. Okay, so for cryptography, we would like to have something that would stand so, like in the middle. Okay, and this is the goal of the suborder representation. Okay, so to, to, to see where these come from, I need to talk a little bit about what we call lollipop endomorphism. So this is the idea that if there is an isogeny phi between E1 and E2, then I can, be, I can build on the morphisms of E2 by, uh, construct, by looking at these lollipop on the morphisms that I get by uh, composing phi and its dual with uh, on the morphisms of E1. Okay, and as you can see in the picture, it gives you some kind of lollipop. So this is where the name come from. And if I consider all those lollipop on the morphisms, I get a full order uh, inside the endomorphism ring of E2, which is actually isomorphic to this uh, Z plus D times endomorphism ring of E1, okay? So in some sense, I get an embedding of this suborder inside the endomorphism ring. And uh, conversely, actually, the existence of this embedding proves that there is, there must be an isogeny phi between E1 and D2 of degree D. So there is, uh, there are small additional conditions, but overall the idea is that really, the existence of this embedding is equivalent to the existence of an isogeny. So this is quite nice, and this is the basis for the suborder representation, which is concretely made of the following information. So first, you have the degree and the two curves, domain and codomain. Then we have the endomorphism ring of E1, so given as 16 coefficients in Z to, to give a basis. Then, uh, and finally, I have these three S1, S2, and S3 which are uh, kernel representations of endomorphisms of E2. And of course, we choose those such, th such that the, this embedding of the lollipop order is generated by those endomorphisms, okay? So it, it's not completely clear uh, and easy to see that uh, how many of those we would need and so on, but actually, uh, yeah, three is, is actually enough and we can choose those to get everything uh, working in polynomial time. So this is where most of the technical details are hidden. And in the paper, we have to, de to develop a bunch of new algorithmic tools to handle all those oper operations uh, efficiently. Uh, but it can be done. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that because it, it's too technical. But I invite you to look at the, the concrete uh, paper if you, you're curious about that. But the bottom line is that we can derive polynomial time algorithms for arbitrary degree, for verify, evaluate, and even for computing this suborder representation from the 
the ideal representation. So everything can be done uh, efficiently. In but, uh, yeah. For now, what I present to you today, it's mostly theoretical, uh, and it's not very practical. We'll give some improvements over that. But at least we have the polynomial time things, which is already a good step toward uh, something efficient. So now let's go back to cryptography. Our original motivation was to have something which was not completely equivalent to the ideal representation. Okay. So in fact, uh, as I said to you, the, the conversion from ideal representation to suborder representation is easy. And that's a good thing because otherwise we wouldn't be able to, to generate a suborder representation because this, as, as you saw, this is not something completely uh, trivial to build, okay? But what is important to us is that the other uh, problem, the reverse problem of computing the ideal representation from the suborder representation, which I call the SOIP for suborder to ideal problem, is hard, okay? And well, uh, it's it's not completely clear due to the recent attacks. I'm going to talk to about that a little bit uh, at the end of the talk. But at least for now, uh, this problem is not is not completely broken. We have actually uh, some related problems. The suborder representation to endomorphisming problem, okay, we, uh, whose goal is to compute the endomorphisming of the codomain. So we, we rebuild some endomorphisms of the codomain by definition of our suborder representation, but not all. Okay, this is the important part. Uh, and actually those are chosen very carefully so that we do not reveal the full endomorphism ring of the codomain. And actually it's do, it do, do not appear very easy to, to compute the endomorphism ring of the codomain as well. And then we have a, a version of the isogeny problem with torsion information. I would want to know if uh, providing some torsion information on the, uh, the isogeny can allow you to compute the ideal representation. And in fact, uh, I show in the paper that all those problems are basically equivalent to one another. Okay, so they are basically yeah, the same. And the best known attack is quantum subexponential in D. And we have such an attack because we reveal some endomorphisms, which are already a lot of information. So. Uh, from uh, exponential attack in the generic isogeny problem, we get down to quantum sub-exponential, but uh, it's still uh, quite hard. And uh, yeah, because basically, yeah, we reveal some endomorphisms, but they do not give the full endomorphism. So this is not enough information. Uh, from that, we build a, a key exchange based on similar, similar idea to SIDH. Okay, and the idea is really to use the gap between ideal and suborder representation so my secrets are going to be ideals and my public keys are suborders, okay? And, uh, oh yeah, something that I should have mentioned earlier, this SOIP problem is actually only hard when the degree is a big prime, okay? If, if it is smooth, then everything basically collapses to something that is quite easy. But when it is a big prime, this is where things get uh, hard and uh, yeah, we do not have efficient algorithms. So in that case, when the degree of the two on, uh, isogenies pi n and pi b of Alice and Bob are co-prime with one another, I can build the following uh, commutative diagram, which is the same diagram that is used for SIDH. The difference is that in SIDH, it was for smooth degrees, but diagram remains the same in essence. And thanks to our new uh, algorithms to evaluate uh, from the suborder representation, we can actually complete this diagram. And so Alice and Bob, uh, can actually end up with, the two, with these two curves, EAB and EBA, which are isomorphic to one another. And this is where the common secret come from in the key exchange. And actually, despite the fact that uh, the idea is quite, actually the picture is similar to SIDH, the profile is much more uh, similar to CSI because first we have a quantum sub-exponential attack. And second, since we have a verified algorithm for our suborder representation, the public keys are verifiable. And this means that P side is actually a non-interactive key exchange because we can verify public keys. So this is a nice feature. Uh, and this is where uh, P side is actually closer to C side in some sense. But of course, uh, those two are not equivalent to one another. So in practice, as I said, P side rather theoretical. So it's not going to be able to compete with C side, uh, at least for now. Uh, but the structure, the mathematical structure is quite different and the hard problem is also different. So hopefully um, we get something, so something which could have some different applications. 
And so I'm just going to conclude by saying that first, isotony-based cryptography is not dead. Uh, it is still an, a, an exciting time to work on isogenies and the daring correspondence. And we just have introduced some new ideas to build cryptography. So it is time to, to work on those and see where uh, this will lead us. And I just don't want to briefly, very briefly conclude by talking a little bit about the impact. Of, uh, as I said in, in the chronology, uh, I proposed the scheme before the, the attacks were published. So um, right now, thanks to this big prime degree, we cannot really apply those attacks, but uh, I think uh, there, there is a real threat uh, and I wouldn't be completely surprised that uh, tweaks and, and variants of the attacks can be used to maybe lower the security or even directly attack the protocol. So this, this is really a problem that needs more study. Uh, in the event uh, where the scheme is not actually broken, I think the new attacks are also a new opportunity. Uh, recently, Damien Robert showed that the objects used in the attacks can also actually be used to represent isogenies. And I think uh, actually this gives something which is quite equivalent to the suborder representation. And I think it would be more efficient. So yeah, if, if the attacks do not break P side, maybe they can make it stronger. So yeah. Just to say that there is still a lot of work to do, but things uh, can be uh, can get quite exciting. So we will see. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I invite you to look at the imprint for all the technical details, and I'll try to answer a few questions. Uh, maybe if the sound come back, I don't know. Um, so yes, so yeah, I'll I'll try just a few. To see if yeah. I can change the, sure. the volume or whatever. Or can Maybe that's why I'm not hearing anything. Okay. Um, I'm afraid that we don't really have time for questions. I'm sorry about that. Um, maybe just send an email to Antonin if you have any questions. And uh, that, I guess, means we should move on to the next speaker. Is the next speaker here? Yep. Please just come up. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm uh, not hearing anything. Okay. We'll deal with that. <laughs> Oh, no time for questions. Okay. Uh, sorry if I, I if I was a little bit too long. Okay. So that means we're ready to have the next uh, talk of this session on isogeny-based cryptography. Uh, the speaker here is Julian Duman, and this is a joint work together with uh, a long list of authors, Dominic Hartmann, Eike Kilt, Sabina Kunzweiler, Jonas Lehmann, and Doreen Riepel. And he's going to talk to us about group action key encapsulation and non-interactive key exchange in the QROM. So please. Hello? Okay, works. Great. Okay, I'm, uh, uh, I'm Julian, and I'm going to talk about uh, group action key encapsulation at non-attractive key exchange in the quantum random oracle model. Yeah, and this is a uh, joint work, as mentioned. Um, okay, so non-attractive key exchange. Uh, we have uh, Alice and Bob. And uh, they are somehow uh, exchanged uh, public keys, but uh, besides exchanging the public keys uh, at uh, some point of time, they uh, can compute a shared key without any interaction. So here in the uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange, it's uh, G to the AB. And uh, as you might know, uh, this uh, uh, key exchange is specifically secure under the decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption. Uh, which uh, states that uh, given G to the A, G to the B, and G to the AB, that uh, this is computationally indistinguishable from uh, G to the A, G to the B, and G to the U. For A, B, and U, uh, uniformly random from ZP, where P is the prime order of the group. Uh, now, there's a slight variation of uh, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange called hash Diffie-Hellman, where uh, G, to the AB, uh, G to the AB is additionally hashed. And uh, 
uh, in this talk on our work, uh, we uh, also have the public key additionally hashed. And uh, interestingly, uh, this variant of the scheme is uh, actively secure under the strong computational DVM and assumption in the randomizer model. So what does the assumption state? Um, the assumption states that uh, it is difficult to compute uh, G to the AB given uh, G to the A and G to the B and an oracle um, which decides whether the first input uh, given exponentiated by A equals uh, G2. So this is a variant of uh, the, uh, so this is a DDH oracle. Uh, and um, now in the uh, quantum world, uh, the thing is that uh, of course, uh, the classical DVM key exchange is not secure anymore. Uh, so um, we have to look at uh, other possibilities and for lattices and codes, it's an open research question to build Nike, but from misogyny based uh, cryptography like Seaside, uh, we have a candidate for quantum resistant Nike. And uh, in our work, we use a uh, group action based uh, abstraction. So we're not going to uh, look at any misogyny details. So what's a cryptographic group action? We have a group. We have a set uh, X and uh, a map mapping from uh, G and X to X, which is called the group action. And we have some additional properties that you might know. Um, in particular, uh, given two group elements, G and H, if you first multiply them and then act on X, then this is the same as first uh, taking H, uh, H uh, acting on X, and then taking G and acting on that element. And there are some additional assumptions that we make, like that uh, G and X uh, are finite and that the group is abelian. And uh, regularity, which uh, states that given two uh, set elements, X1 and X2, uh, that there exists a unique G, uh, which uh, with uh, G acting on X1 equals X2, and a distinguished element, uh, X tilde, which we call the origin. Um, so the quantum random oracle model, we have to talk about that so that we can uh, um, continue. We have, uh, the thing is, if we want to uh, study quantum resistance schemes and we are in the random oracle model, then um, we have to consider the fact that the quantum computer can make superposition queries. And uh, so to model that, uh, we extend, uh, extend the random oracle to be quantum accessible. And this is called the quantum random oracle model. Um, yeah. So having talked uh, about that, we can now look at the uh, uh, Nike or hash DVLMAN equivalent in the group action setting. Uh, so here we have uh, kind of the same thing as in the classical case, but uh, uh, we have uh, the group action that we use. So what was before G to the AB is now here AB operating or acting on, on the origin. And what we do in our work is uh, we study when the scheme is uh, secure and we prove that uh, we need a quantum accessible version of the strong CDH assumption uh, uh, to prove, uh, or we need to show that, uh, or we show that it's necessary to have a quantum accessible version of the strong CDH assumption for active security in the QROM. We give a, a proof from such an assumption. And uh, then what we do is we give uh, constructions with uh, weaker assumptions and also prove the security of the corresponding camps. And uh, in particular, uh, we give the first construction and proof of a Nike from uh, the group action CDH assumption with active security in the QROM. So, for this talk, we are more going to uh, we're going to more look at the key encapsulation uh, variant because the proof is a little bit simpler and uh, the CCA security of the chem is kind of similar to the actual security of the Nike. And here we have the group action hashed uh, El Gamal uh, scheme. So there's uh, one. Uh, other thing that we need to prove security in the QROM, that is the one way to hiding lemma. In the classical ROM, um, when there's an element X star, 
If the adversary doesn't carry that element, then h of x star is going to look random. And in the QROM, uh, you can make a single superposition query, and then you have basically queried uh, every element, so that same argument doesn't hold uh, like that. But the one way to hiding lemma allows uh, to reprogram uh, values of the random oracle, because basically uh, the intuition there is that uh, for an adversary to notice the reprogramming, then it needs to be enough weight on X star. Uh, and if the weight is noticeable, then measuring just the random query will give X star with a noticeable probability. And there exist several improved uh, variants of that lemma, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, so let's now talk about the assumptions. So um, the group action uh, strong CDH assumption states that given G star origin and H star origin, it's difficult to compute GH star origin. And um, additionally, given access to a decision oracle, where we have the same equivalent as in the classic diffie uh, strong CDH uh, case, only that it's now group actions. So the uh, DDH oracle here um, decides whether X1, uh, G acting on X1, is equal to X2. And there's now the fully quantum uh, version where uh, the adversary has uh, quantum access to both inputs. This we call the uh, group action fully quantum strong CDH uh, assumption or, or problem. Then there's a variant where the only the second input is uh, quantum accessible and the first input is classical. This we call the partially quantum strong CDH assumption. Uh, then there's a variant where both inputs are classical. This is just a group action strong CDH assumption. And then you have the uh, a group action CDH assumption where there's no oracle access. Okay, so now let's uh, go through the uh, proof idea of why uh, the partially quantum strong CDH assumption is necessary. So here we are um, given an adversary against the uh, partially quantum strong CDH assumption uh, here. And we are breaking the CCA uh, security of the CHEM. So here we're giving the public key of the CHEM of uh, group action hashed algamal, the ciphertext, and the CHEM key, which is either uh, real or random. And so we're going to plug in the public key uh, as a first input and the ciphertext as a second input. And we are going to run this uh, adversary, which uh, 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 breaks the uh, group action uh, partially quantum strong CDH assumption. And we have to simulate to it the EDH oracle. So th this is basically the question to answer. And once, uh, once we have the CDH solution, we can uh, hash uh, the CDH solution compared to the chem key to decide whether it's real or random. So how do we simulate the DDH oracle? So the idea here is that uh, DCAPS uh, evaluates to HX1 G operating on X1. And these are uh, valid, uh, these are valid uh, Diffie-Hellman tuple. And we can compare this to the input of the DDH oracle X1, X2. And uh, for the challenge, we uh, can't query DCAPS on the challenge uh, ciphertext. So here we shift it by an element uh, element uh, G, um, yeah. but other than that, it's from here. And so now uh, the main observation is that uh, X1 is used in the decapsulation oracle. And in this CA game, the decapsulation oracle is uh, classical. So X1 needs to be classical. But for X2, it's used here only in the, in the uh, quantum random oracle. And so it can be quantum. So here we can simulate a part partially quantum oracle. So now let's go uh, through the proof uh, of the active security of uh, group action hash diagramal. So the main question here is how to simulate decapsulation. And for decapsulation, what we are going to do is we have uh, for the random oracle x1 and x2, and we're going to uh, split it into two cases. 
one for valid uh, GDH uh, tuples and one for invalid ones. And for the uh, valid ones, we're going, going to get rid of the second input, x2, because that's the value where the secret key is uh, used here. And once we have uh, done that, um, we can uh, just uh, return h1, x1 in the decapsulation. And this is then the correct uh, simulation of the decapsulation oracle. Uh, yeah. So the caveat here now the of, of the observation is that uh, the random oracle is quantum accessible. And because of that, uh, here the DDH oracle also needs to be quantum accessible. So um, this is where the, the where, where we need the fully quantum uh, assumption to prove security here. And then after how uh, I showed how to simulate decapsulation, we just use one way to hide and to reprogram the random oracle on the challenge input. So that's basically the proof. So the next question then is, uh, can we do uh, better? Can we use uh, weaker assumptions to prove security uh, with alternative constructions? And uh, the first option is uh, key confirmation hash. Here we prove security from the group actions from CDH assumption. But unfortunately, this only works for the CAM. And the second option is that we uh, generalize twinning to group actions. And this works for both uh, Nike and CAM. Uh, and here we prove uh, security from the group action CDH assumption. So what is a key confirmation hash? Um, so here we have another random oracle, H prime. And uh, we're going to add this value to the encapsulation C. Or ciphertext. Uh, and um, the idea here is that uh, since uh, access to the decapsulation oracle is classical, the key confirmation hash is also going to be classical. And uh, there exist techniques uh, to extract AB uh, acting on the origin from the key confirmation hash. And uh, once the simulator has done that, it can use a classical DDH oracle uh, to check for the validity of. Uh, of uh, this element that it is a valid DDH tuple uh, together with the, the ciphertext. And so we only need, therefore, the group action strong CDH assumption. Uh, as mentioned, the caveat here is that this only works for the CAM because now, now it's interactive. So, what is uh, twinning uh, for the Diffie Hellman uh, key exchange? Um, uh, there exists a variant uh, uh, where you double basically the key size here. And you pair every part from the public key with every part here from the secret key. So G to the A1, uh, B1 to up to G to the A2, B2. And uh, here, basically, uh, you can show uh, security from the CDH assumption, uh, active security. And uh, the intuition here is that uh, the trapdoor test allows to simulate the decision oracle from the, from the strong CDH uh, assumption. Um, yeah, what we do is that we uh, generalize this for the to the group action setting, but unfortunately here the key sizes are not uh, doubled, but uh, it's m times the key, uh, key size where m is relatively large, and again we have to pair every part here from the keys with every part from the other key, so here we have m squared uh, operations, so it's a rather here theoretical construction. Uh, but uh, we prove active security from the group action CDH assumption here. Yeah, and uh, this is basically it. Um, yeah, thank you. Hello. Ah, okay. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, Turns out we have plenty of time for questions, so I didn't really have to cut off Antonin so much, but <laughs> well, that's the past. Uh, does anybody want to ask a question in the room? It doesn't appear so. So I guess I can ask a question that's maybe very dumb, but uh, so on the previous slide, you had the uh, M equals 85. Um, what, what, how exactly does the, the attack look if you just don't use enough M here? like? I'm I'm kind of, kind of just wondering how does the attacker approach this? If you just use not enough M, <laughs> that's a good question which I can't answer because it was not my department. 
uh, <laughs> I was more on the uh, other part. I don't know actually. Yeah. <laughs> A good question. I don't know. Anybody else? I already embarrassed myself, so now maybe other people can stop being shy. And, uh, okay. I guess if not, then uh, and it also appears there's nobody asking on Zoom. I guess we can just uh, call it a day. And oh no, wait, we have one more talk. But finish this talk. Uh, so thanks again uh, to Julian, and Thank you. the next speaker may come up, please. Tested. Yep. Uh, while they're setting up all the technology, uh, let me introduce the next and final speaker of the session, uh, Mark Huben. And he's going to speak about uh, joint work with Walter Kastrick, Thomas de Gru, and Frederik Wegauteren, all from Leuven, uh, about horizontal race walking using radical isogenies. So, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So this topic that I'm going to talk about, uh, radical isogenies, if you don't understand anything from my talk, maybe you can remember that this is some method that you can use to speed up isogeny-based protocols, uh, in particular, the ones that are based on uh, computing long chains of isogenies of a small degree, uh, such as what happens in uh, a protocol called Seaside, which is an isogeny-based key exchange protocol. So we're already talking a lot about key exchanges today. So I'll uh, put everything in this framework again. So there's roughly, well, there's exactly two types of uh, isogeny-based key exchanges. So there's the ones that are based on class group actions and the ones that are not. So based on class group actions, there's CRS, which is basically the OG of isogeny based cryptography. Uh, then also C site and generalizations like O site. And then on the other side, we have basically only SIDH and variants of that. And as far as I know, these have all been broken recently. So that's why I'm going to focus on the left side of the slide and mainly on as a main example, which we had in the back of our mind, uh, C site. And then, yes, okay, I didn't forget about Antonin's talk from an hour ago. So there's also this thing called P site. Uh, and I don't know actually where to put it in this picture. So, uh, you'd think on the right, but there is like an underlying group action uh, that Antonet didn't talk about, but this is actually, this yields a sub-exponential quantum attack. So I'm not sure, maybe Antonet can answer this at the end of my talk where he thinks this should be. Uh, in any case, so we're gonna focus on these class group actions. And the idea is very simple. So we have a uh, starting elliptic curve, E0, and Alice and Bob both have secret elements of a certain ideal class group that acts on elliptic curves. So they act on this curve E0, and then they act on what the other person got by doing this. And as long as a group action is commutative, which it is because uh, class groups are commutative, 
they end up at the same result, which is then their shared secret elliptic curve. So now the question is, how do you do this in practice? So in practice, how do you go from these magic ideal classes to elliptic curves? Uh, and these ideal classes, they induce maps between elliptic curves. So there's a map from E0 to AE0. And this is called an isogeny. That's why it's called isogeny-based cryptography. And what you essentially do is you break this map up into smaller maps that are easier to compute. So for Seaside, the picture looks a bit like this. So this is called an isogeny graph. So the vertices here are elliptic curves and the edges are the maps between the elliptic curves. So the isogenies. And in this picture, the blue, red, and green uh, edges correspond to isogenies of degree three, five, and seven. And so what Alice does when she wants to compute, uh, let's say her public key, is she starts at E0, which is some elliptic curve. Uh, then she does a couple of three isogenies. Uh, at some point she stops, she gets some elliptic curve. Uh, then she does a couple of five isogenies, bunch of seven isogenies. And in the end, she gets some elliptic curve. And as long as she doesn't tell anyone how many isogenies of every degree she used, it should be difficult to find the path that she got. So that's basically the idea. Uh, so also to put this a bit into context, uh, so Seaside, I think it's a very nice scheme. Uh, it's currently one of the most promising post-quantum key exchange protocols. Uh, it is the post-quantum key exchange proposal with the smallest key sizes. Uh, the main disadvantage is that it's relatively slow. So uh, we don't really know an efficient way to compute these isogeny walks. So essentially the problem is how do you efficiently compute a chain of isogenies of a small degree? So that's essentially uh, what the research I'm talking about today is about. So here's the problem, uh, given an isogeny, so let's say we have already one step of our walk. So we have one isogeny of a certain degree n, which is given by taking the quotient by a cyclic subgroup. So I have this point P on E that has order n. And now I want to find the next step of the walk, which is equivalent to finding a point P prime on the codomain, such that when I take the quotient by P prime, uh, I get a cyclic extension of my original isogeny. So how do you find this P prime thing? Uh, one way to do it is just to try random points. So you can sample random points on E prime and you can multiply by this cofactor to the order of the group divided by N. And then you hope, well, first of all, that P prime has order N and also that it cyclically extends the isogeny. Uh, and this is why C site is slow. So this is what they used essentially before radical isogenies. Uh, and the reason it's slow is because this multiplication by this large factor of Q. And also it's not deterministic, like this thing can fail. So sometimes you have to try another point. And that's also not super nice for certain applications like constant time. So what are alternatives? Uh, there's something that's based on modular polynomials, which uh, is also, depending on the implementation, probably also not deterministic and also not fast. So this is not super nice. And then another way is to construct this point P prime as the root of a certain polynomial. So this is called the N division polynomial. It has as its roots the coordinates of the and torsion points. So P prime should be somewhere among those roots. And this is essentially the idea that leads to radical isogenies. But you don't extract the root every time. You essentially just find a formula for the root that always works. So how do you find this formula? I have an example using five isogenies. So we had our assumption, so we had one step of the isogeny walk. So we had 
a point P on E of order five in this case. And then it turns out that you can always write your curve in this very special form where B is some parameter. So if you put this point at the origin, then you can write your curve like this. This is called the Tate normal form. Uh, and now this is cool because now what we're gonna do is we're gonna treat B as a variable and we're gonna see what happens to the next curve in the, in the isogeny walk. So first we write down the equation for E prime. This is, this is some equation. You just take the quotient by P, you get something in terms of B. Uh, and then you want to find on this curve, this point P prime that we were talking about. So you write down the five division polynomial. It's some polynomial. Don't exactly matter what it is, but it's something with this B again. Uh, and then you get these coordinates. Uh, so this is some expression in terms of B and alpha. Alpha is the fifth root of B. And this is actually where the name radical isogenies comes from because uh, this is what's called a radical in mathematics. Uh, and this point P prime always turns out to give you a cyclic extension of, uh, of your original isogeny. Uh, and now the last thing you can do is actually you can write this pair E prime P prime again in this state normal form. So you can find the value of B prime that's associated to this curve point pair. And this thing on the bottom right, that is actually the radical isogeny formula. So this thing you can iterate. So this just gives you the B prime of the next curve in the sequence. And if you iterate that, then that's the same thing as doing an isogeny walk. Uh, okay, so that's pretty cool. And this is deterministic and it's also very fast, much faster than sampling random points. So now the question is, can you do this for arbitrary degrees? Uh, and the answer is theoretically, yes. So you can prove that the radical isogenies formulas, they always exist. But if you want to find them this way, then you're not gonna get super far. So in the previous radical isogeny paper, uh, the highest degree that we got was uh, 13. And this was using this method also combined with additional tricks. So what we did in, the, in this paper essentially is to, to find a new method to find the formulas. So in general, uh, the Tate normal form looks a bit like this. So there's two parameters instead of one. So there's B and C and they satisfy some algebraic relation that states that the point at the origin has order N. Uh, and then the fancy way to say it is that this pair BC lies on the modular curve X1N. And then the radical isogeny formula. So that's just the formula for B prime and C prime of the next curve in terms of B and C. And there's this alpha again, which is now the nth root of something. It doesn't exactly matter what it is. It's called the Tate N self pairing, whatever. It's some expression again in terms of B and C. And now the idea uh, is essentially we found a way to determine these coefficients of this formula explicitly by rational interpolation. And for that idea is extremely simple. So what you just do is you sample a lot of points, a lot of pairs B, C, and then you look what the outcome of the formula should be. Uh, and as long as you have enough samples, they can interpolate the function that belongs to this uh, correspondence. Uh, and you do this over a lot of small fields FP. And the reason I wrote, wrote smallish over there is because you still need the field to be big enough for there to be enough samples in the first place. So in practice, we had primes of size about bit size 32 here. Uh, and once you have enough of those, then you can live to characteristic zero using the Chinese remainder theorem. Uh, okay. Uh, using this, you can 
extend the formulas up to degree 37. Okay, cool. So what's the next thing we did? We also optimized the formula a little bit. So we wrote them a little bit. So I just have an example here. So previously we had this thing, which is the radical eight isogeny formula. Uh, and we rewrote it. So this is just the same formula with a slightly different alpha, which is much nicer. And we did this for all of the formulas that we already had and also for the new ones. We just tried to rewrite them a little bit so that they're faster to evaluate. And there's a lot of tricks to do that. I'm not gonna go into all the details of that. But in any case, we got like compact forms of, of the formulas that we already had. Uh, and then there's one more technical thing that we did. So for even degree isogenies, the isogeny graph looks a little bit different. So be, before you had like the three, five, and seven. Uh, and for that, you always get a circle. But for, let's say, two isogenies, you also have some things going out of the circle. And the isogenies that go along the circle are called horizontal isogenies. And the ones that go out of the circle are called vertical isogenies. Uh, and when you do the radical isogeny formula thing, then you have to compute this alpha, right? And this alpha is inter for two isogenies, it's just a square root of something. And what we did is basically we determined which of the square roots you have to take in order to do the horizontal isogeny, which is the one you want to have. Uh, we have a conjecture uh, for all even degrees which one you should take, which is a non-trivial conjecture, uh, which you proved up to degree 14. Uh, okay, here are the benchmarks. So if you combine all of this, then asymptotically you get factor four improvement for a change of two isogenies. Uh, practically we got factor three over 512 bit prime fields. And we also gained 12% over the previous implementation of C-site using radical isogenies. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the, again, fairly short talk. So uh, again, sorry to Antonin for cutting you off so quickly. Um, does anybody in the room want to ask a question? Yes, uh, I can, sure. Thank you, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I have a, a question. So you say that you extended the, the formulas for the radical isogenies up to n equal to 37. Uh, in CSERF, uh, you need uh, isogenies with larger degree. So how do you manage? So for the larger degrees, you use older uh, different methods. So the methods that already existed for larger degrees you use there. And in fact, so there's kind of a trade-off. So the radical isogeny formulas, once you have them, they're always asymptotically better than all of the other methods as we know. But at some point, they get really, really complicated. So I already showed you like this one for eight isogeny is already quite ugly. When you get this the degree 37, then you really have megabytes of equations. And then in practice, it's not, it's not useful anymore. So I think right now we go up to degree 19. We use them up to degree 19 and then the ones that we have higher than that for 512 bits, they're not even useful. So there we just use the old methods to, to walk along the isogeny graph. Right, but then, then I, I, I have the question, where, how can you get this amazing uh, acceleration factor for three times? Uh, because, um, so one thing you can do is to use more isogenies of smaller degree. So you can get similar key spaces by using, let's say, 200 isogenies of degree two 
but only one or two of degree, I don't know, 47. So you kind of skew the box out of which you sample your keys. And then the radical isogenies become more important. Okay, uh, and, and have you compared with other uh, implementations besides CSERF, like CTIT or? So this is the one we compared it to because this was the one that we used before for radical isogenies. And we wanted to compare the improvement we had for the radical isogeny part. But right now I don't think there even exists like a state of the art implementation of CSIT that uses all of the tricks in the book. But if there would be, then it would be nice to see what percentage you gain over that. Why do you say that? There, there have been several works trying to in, improve as much as possible the site. Yeah, yeah, of course, but there's nothing, I think, right now, but you can correct me, I would be happy to know, Yeah, that uses all of the tricks, including the ones in this paper. Okay, maybe later we can. Yeah, that would be, okay. that would be cool. Thank you very much. Okay, anybody else? More questions? Uh, I, I, I can ask a question, I guess. So uh, you said that the formulas are really, really big for degrees that are greater than 19 or something. Is that you think because they're, they intrinsically have to be that big or because you just didn't like find the correct optimizations to write them in a nicer way yet? So intrinsically, I think they should grow. Uh, I don't know of any mathematical explanation. Well, okay, so one mathematical explanation is that um, okay, so this is a little bit technical, but maybe I can explain with this example of the Tate normal form. So, so you have this pair BC and it satisfies a certain equation. So essentially the coefficients of the radical isogeny formulas are going to be elements of the function field of this curve. But this curve has a certain gonality, which is the degree of the smallest map to P1. And you cannot hope for formulas that have degrees smaller than that already. So that already gives you at least, yeah, increasing formulas, let's say. Uh, then, yeah, sure. I, I'm sure that there's better ways to optimize them that we haven't found. But yeah, I, I honestly don't know the range up to when they will ever be useful. Potential for improvement if anybody wants to look for possible ways. <laughs> uh, I guess there's no more questions. So correct me if I'm wrong. Also nothing on Zoom. So let's thank the speaker again and thanks to all speakers in the session. Uh, and next up is a five minute track switch break, which we've extended to about 10 minutes. So you have extra time to maybe grab a coffee if there's still